With 95% of the ocean floor unexplored, the deep sea is Earth's last frontier. Its pioneers are scientists, leveraging the latest technology to cast light on the massive and incomprehensibly dark environment that extends more than 35,000 feet down. Until recently, this world was known only to our planet's most unearthly species. This is the story of our largest biome, and the people devoting themselves to understanding it and saving it for future generations. 40 years ago, we discovered hydrothermal vents, which act as Earth's plumbing system, transporting chemicals and extreme heat from the molten core of our planet, helping to regulate the chemical makeup of the oceans. But this seemingly toxic environment is still home to life. Organisms that don't need photosynthesis to survive can live down here, and with most of the seafloor left to explore, many species remain undiscovered. Studying these unlikely ecosystems can teach us about the earliest stages of life's evolution here on Earth, and about the possibility of life on other planets. That's why NASA is working with oceanographers to help plan the mission to explore Jupiter's ice-covered moon, Europa. And because these vents form in active volcanic zones, they also help us better understand how land forms and moves over time. Plus, the sludge that's constantly spewing from the vents contains some of the most valuable metals known to man. In the deep ocean, where the water is as dark as ink, lie riches that no treasure hunters have managed to retrieve. They are deposits of precious minerals, from cobalt to gold, that have tantalized miners and nations for decades. In 2019, a Canadian company will make the first ever attempt at extracting these minerals. Using the latest technologies and massive, custom-designed vehicles, it aims to bring up $1.5 billion worth of metals from a single site 25 kilometers off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Nautilus says it will minimize environmental damage by using infrared cameras and sonar to pinpoint the exact location of ore deposits, allowing it to shred less of the ocean floor. But environmentalists aren't buying it. Preserving a sensitive ecosystem 8,000 feet underwater from the impact of mining is just not that simple. Unfortunately, we may not have much choice. There's growing demand for these metals, but dwindling supplies of them on land. Cobalt, for instance, is used in jet engines, lithium-ion batteries, and the computer smartphone you're watching this video on, and the machines we made it on. This age-old clash between miners and environment is really just one chapter in a much larger story of technology development. Innovations aimed at maintaining the delicate balance of the increasingly threatened ocean ecosystem. One such tool is the EK80 Broadband Acoustic Echo Sounder. It uses a range of frequencies to paint a much more comprehensive picture of the amount and types of species living in a selected area of water. What you see can be very different at different frequencies. For example, if you're using very low frequency sound, you're not gonna see the zooplankton. So you might think, oh, the ocean is empty. There's nothing here. But then you look at a higher frequency and suddenly you see the zooplankton. People think that there's much more biomass locked down in the mesopelagic zone. It has been grotesquely underestimated. As a biologist, I wanna know ecologically meaningful quantities, like how many animals are there present? Uh, what size are they? What kind are they? Species mapping should also help identify the areas of the ocean where the most life exists, from the ocean floor all the way up to the surface, allowing us to then protect those areas. Only 5% of the ocean is currently protected in some way, compared to 15% of land. Another urgent problem is multi-drug resistant bacteria that kill thousands of people a year. By gathering microbes from different parts of the sea, Researchers can test many different combinations to create the most effective medicines. We are finding microbes that produce really interesting chemistry and could be used to develop new therapeutics in the future. From Bermuda off the backs of Trichodesmium, which is a small phytoplankton, from mud samples up in Vancouver, and from right off the beach here at Shore Lab, from of all places, a, a comb jelly. We've only cultured 1-2% to 2 of all marine bacteria. So can you imagine the chemical diversity waiting there to be discovered, described, and harnessed? Biofluorescence, which has revolutionized neuroscience over the past two decades, is yet another powerful tool that came from the ocean. These proteins were first found in corals, 
But marine biologists like David Gruber have discovered that many other sea animals also possess this light-altering trait. We set out just looking for this one fish, and in the process we discovered 20 other. We began thinking, what about sharks? Glow-in-the-dark sharks are pretty cool, but the most critical area of ocean research surrounds climate change and how our planet's interconnected ecosystem will be affected in the future. The atmospheric physicist Susan Avery summarized this in a TED talk a few years back. Not only is that infusion of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere inducing warming on the planet, it also is inducing major chemical changes on a global scale in the ocean. And that bottom curve shows what's happening in terms of the pH, which is a measure of the acidification of the ocean. The ocean uptakes carbon from the atmosphere. When that carbon dioxide enters the ocean, it dissolves. It becomes more acidic. As the upper layers mix with the lower levels, the pH decreases, and you have a more acidic global ocean. Irish oceanographer Triona McGrath expanded on this point during a recent TED Talk of her own. There has already been an increase in ocean acidity of 26% since pre-industrial times, which is directly due to human activities. Unless we can start slowing down our carbon dioxide emissions, we're expecting an increase in ocean acidity of 170% by the end of this century. I mean, this is within our children's lifetime. This rate of acidification is 10 times faster than any acidification in our oceans for over 55 million years. So our marine life has never, ever experienced such a fast rate of change before. So we literally could not know how they're going to cope. Now, there was a natural acidification event millions of years ago, which was much slower than what we're seeing today. And this coincided with a mass extinction of many marine species. We're already seeing evidence of acidification damaging corals and shellfish. As acidification increases, the shells of many of these species will stop growing and eventually begin to dissolve. Pteropods, for example, play a vital role in the ocean's food system, feeding everything from krill to salmon to whales. In one terrifying experiment, the shell of the pteropod was placed into seawater with a pH level that we are on course to experience by the end of the century. After just 45 days, you can see how the shell almost completely dissolved. Facts like this underscore the important role oceanic research plays in preparing humanity for the challenges that lie ahead. One man who's been instrumental in the field of deep sea discovery is Robert Ballard. A leading explorer of shipwrecks, Ballard has led the takeover of remote operated vehicle exploration. His large research vessel, the EV Nautilus, is equipped with four ROVs. Ballard is using one of the most sophisticated underwater exploration systems ever assembled. It allows him to go where no one has gone before. Mark, the vehicles are designed to go to 20,000 feet, so we're not restricted by depth. In fact, I prefer going deep. But what makes Ballard's setup truly state-of-the-art is its cutting-edge telepresence system. The Nautilus crew can beam live HD video of microbes at the bottom of the sea to a biologist sitting in front of an internet-connected computer anywhere on Earth, helping to stretch the extremely tight budgets of oceanic researchers everywhere. But not every explorer is ready to give up the benefits of seeing a new place with their own eyes. In 2012, the deep-pocketed director of Titanic, James Cameron, piloted a submarine he designed and built himself, the Deep Sea Challenger, to the bottom of the Mariana Trench, the deepest part of the ocean. feet, and everything looks good. After completing his expedition, Cameron generously donated the multi-million dollar vehicle to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Manned submersibles have played an important role in the brief history of ocean exploration, 
but the discovery of the RMS Titanic, whose story Cameron famously told in his 1997 blockbuster film, was actually made by Robert Ballard and his unmanned remote-operated vehicles. September 1st, 1985, 1 a.m. Initially, we didn't know if we were on the right trail until that magic moment when the boiler came underneath our cameras. We had a picture of that boiler on the wall of the control van, and everyone's head looked to the picture, looked back, and we knew it was the Titanic. Just like they had done in the search for the Titanic, unmanned remote-operated vehicles can stay submerged for days at a time, and, with technology getting better by the day, land-based researchers watching on their computers will feel more and more like they're right down there with the robot on the bottom of the ocean. When I started, Alvin was really the only effective way to get to the seafloor, to do science on the seafloor. ROVs were not a primary tool for getting to the seafloor. In the 25 years I've been at the institution, ROVs have progressed to the point that now they're a completely balanced scientific tool all over the world. This vehicle is, is equipped to handle all sides of deep sea exploration. These are brand new cameras that we got and they're just phenomenal. We get detail that you couldn't see in a man submersible through a porthole. Yeah, but regardless of whether we use human operated or robotic vehicles, what matters most is that we're giving our scientists the resources they need to continue exploring, learning, and sharing what they're finding. These are the moments I live for. You spend all this time out on the sea, and then, in between all the searching, you make these incredible discoveries. Push back, push back, push back. Make discoveries that completely rewrite history. That is what an explorer wants to do. Thanks for watching. We had a lot of fun exploring the future of farming a few videos back, and since you seem to enjoy it too, we'll continue this series with the future of internet infrastructure as one of our next videos. That idea was based on an awesome comment suggestion. Those really help us out, so keep them coming. Until next time, for TDC, I'm Bryce Plank.